This is HighIntensityBusiness.com with Lawrence Neal, helping you achieve your health and fitness goals. Become a great personal trainer and build your high-intensity strength training business. All right, so here we go. Lawrence Neal here. Welcome back to HighIntensityBusiness.com. This is episode 266. Today's guests are the Truth Not Trends podcast hosts and personal trainers, Jesse Schmidt and Liam Bauer, and Fitness Candle host and personal trainer, Eric Feigl. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Great to have you. Happy to be Thanks here. Thanks for having us. Thanks. No, it's, it's my pleasure, and I've been looking forward to this. Uh, obviously, we scheduled this a while back and been looking forward to just all get together and really talk about what's going on and learn as much as I can from you guys, actually, since you're seeing as you're really the experts in a lot of this, it seems. And I've really been enjoying uh, your Truth Not Trends podcast, some of the recent episodes I've been listening to. Um, really enjoy listening to, to both of you, uh, Liam and Jesse, uh, and l- learning from you know, your experience. Liam, you seem to have, it sounds like you just have a ton of experience um, in personal training. I'd love to just kick this off with a little bit of context, a little bit of background. Um, Liam, do you want to kick off with your background and then we can kind of move on to Jesse and Eric and then start getting into some meaty topics? All right, I'll, I'll try to um, condense it as much as possible. But I, I was an athlete when I was in college. Uh, I played football for the, for the people on your side of the pond. And uh, not American football. And um, I, I uh, played in college. I played semi-professionally after college. I uh, started tra- strength training later in my football career, uh, rehabbing from injuries and trying to um, enhance my, my performance. And, and I, I didn't know anything about it like most people do. Uh, I didn't know anything about strength training. And I dove in and trained, you know, six days a week, three hours a day. and. Uh, because that's what Arnold told me to do. And then I uh, got out of college and decided to get a job in fitness. And I just, by pure luck, landed my very first job in a Nautilus gym that was connected directly to the Nautilus factory and the Nautilus um, distributors in the area. And uh, they practiced and preached the Nautilus principles. And and I was indoctrinated into that. And uh, transparently was not, you know, didn't, what was not initially open to it, but saw it before my eyes, you know, like all these people having success and slowly but surely uh, embraced more and more components of it as I, as I continued to just devour information. I, I uh, would just go from gym to gym and absorb as much information as I could from anyone who I felt had something to offer. And when I felt like I'd sort of sucked that place dry for information, I would go on to the next place. And I was also um, piling up certifications along the way so I've got pretty much every certification, sort of the alphabet soup of, you know, ACSMs and <laughs> NSPAs and NSCAs and, uh, you know, um, things along the way. And uh, earlier, er, early on, early on, people started asking me for help and I started, uh, you know, giving advice. There was no such thing as personal trainers when I started. I started back in 1988 and um, there were no personal trainers, but people just would start asking me advice all the time and, and asking me for help. And I just started coaching people. And also very early on in the internet days, I, um, I got on the internet in the 90s and uh, I, I, w- I also teach self-defense, just as a weird side thing. And, and uh, I've been doing martial arts since I was a kid. And I got on as a, strength, as a moderator on a strength and conditioning forum inside a huge martial arts website, probably the biggest martial arts website in the world at the time. And I was a moderator on that strength and conditioning forum for about 15 years. And that's where I started writing and talking to people all the time online and building sort of a following for my information online. And uh, 10 or 11 years ago, I started a website, podcast, YouTube, all that stuff. None of it amounted to anything. And then uh, three years ago, I met Jesse and he actually listened to me, unlike most people, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> That was going to be my next question: Was how did you convert Jesse? Because Jesse, you're a, you're a young guy, you're a young guy, right? I, you know, and it was yeah. it's always interesting to see someone, um, you know, especially your age. Um, I'm assuming you're perhaps younger than you are. I don't know. Um, I'm 32. And, oh, okay, you're my so, age. You're my age. Well, youngish. But you look good for you. <laughs> oh, thanks. And, and, 
And you seem to be, you know, I, I, I understand obviously some of your philosophy and Liam's background, and uh, it sounds right. like you're fairly open-minded to um, high-intensity training or related themes when it comes to exercise. So, what was the? What, do you remember the moment when you kind of when, when you were listening to Liam, perhaps, and it made sense to you, and then you sort of because I'm guessing you perhaps had a different kind of background in fitness, but I'm jumping ahead. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so. I mean, Liam and I, uh, I got hired at the, at the same big box gym that Liam had been working at for a while. And um, I came in with my NASM cert thinking that I knew everything there was to know. You know, I'd read the Schwarzenegger encyclopedia and just was pretty much all ego. Um, but the other thing about me at that time, which was, this is about three years ago now, is that I was looking for a mentor actively and I had my eyes open and I was, it wasn't just Liam that I was learning from. I, I really wanted, you know, we had, a, we had somewhere between 10 and 15 trainers on staff at the gym and I, I was trying to learn as much as I could from everyone. So, but it just, it, just the way it played out when Liam started talking, we, we, on, on our show, we call uh, Liam's idioms, Liamisms, because he's got all these, <laughs> he's got all these turns of phrase that just hit home so well. Like when he's talking about, how to how to stimulate uh, you know positive failure? How to stimulate new strength and how that's like you know pressing an elevator button. Once you press it, you don't need to press it again. I mean, he just he just comes up with these things. It seems like the, it's they're off the top of his head, but it's he's almost like a you know like a, a stage performer, like a comedian or something. It's it's been rehearsed so many times over his thirty two years of experience that it almost seems like it's just off the cuff and. Um, so I actually, I remember the day that things really started to hit home for me and I was, you know, I was in the weight room and I was doing my own workout and I was doing some, some weighted chin-ups and uh, I, you know, I, I do, I'm a rock climber and I've done some ninja warrior training and I, I think of myself as pretty good with the pulling movements, pretty, I'm pretty light, pretty strong. And so Liam just kind of was passing by and he asked me what I was doing. And I said, you know, well, I'm going to start with this, you know, 25 pound weight and I'm going to work my way up to a one rep max. And he, he said, why don't you just start with the heaviest one? And that was a new concept for me. And it really, I mean, that was, that was the posing it as a question was a great way to get my gears turning. And I think from that point on, I listened with a little bit of a closer ear to the things that he was saying. And I just found there to be so much resonance uh, and wisdom in what he was talking about. Not to mention, I mean, he's, he's a funny guy. Uh, he, he's the type of person that, you know, you just, you start peeling that onion and, and you just end up with more and more onion. It's, it's amazing. So um, yeah, it, it's uh, uh, one day we just turned on the mics and, you know, things just, seem to flow pretty well. And so we've been having a lot of fun with uh, the TNT podcast since then. Yeah, you guys done a great job. Um, really impressed Thank you. with what I've heard. And you have, you're both very entertaining and very articulate. And I think it's a great resource um, for people. And, and I would just say, um, we're going to be talking a bit about training here. But um, if you want to get more information on how to get great results from home using uh, evidence-based resistance training slash high-intensity training principles, then do listen to some of their recent episodes because they're great for that. Um, Eric, I would ask you for your bio right now, but we just did that like yesterday. And uh, everyone, would have listened to, <laughs> everyone would have listened to episode 265 already. At the same time, because I know that your time is restricted or limited, um, we'll, we'll just get straight into it um, from, from this point. Um, so, Guys, I some of you might have heard a roundtable I did um, with Adam Zickerman, Luke Carlson, Melinda Hughes, and Scarlett Tanner on how they're kind of responding to this crisis. It was kind of early on uh, in the shutdown and how they were kind of adapting in their business. Uh, and obviously, a lot of our colleagues, a lot of those guys had transitioned to virtual training. Um, and so I'm really curious to get your thoughts on this and see what you guys are doing. So Jesse, I think you said on one of the podcasts on TNT, you've been doing um, some virtual training yourself. So can you just discuss or, or describe what you've been doing there? Sure. And, um, you know, I did catch your roundtable episode and I thought that what 
you know, each of those different business owners were doing and pivoting to the online training was very savvy and ahead of the curve. And um, I think it's I think it's what everyone who has the maneuverability should be doing right now. Um, it uh, so yeah, I have been training some clients online and having success with that. I've found it's almost like you know training your own client because you know they're not new clients; they're current clients that are training with me. Um, it's almost like training them again for the first time. And in my opinion, the reason for that is that people tend to get kind of stuck in their ways in terms of what tools they're using. You know, if you're in our, in our gym, you know, we have a lot of machines, we have the free weights. Um, you know, we don't, we do tend to mix in some body weight stuff, some really, really not any resistance span, you know, exercises. And so I think the tool is, is a part of it. Um, people wonder, you know, can I, can I actually replicate, you know, uh, you know, a 200 pound leg press, with, you know, just my own body weight or just, you know, some resistance bands and, um, and you can, and it's just a matter of knowing the right protocols to use and, um, and executing those. So, um, I've been having a great time training some of my clients. It's, it's reminded both of us how important, um, the training is both, you know, for me as a, as a, uh, you know, running my own training business. And, um, also, you know, it, it's something that I do because I love it and gives me an intrinsic, you know, benefit. Um, so I, I feel good. I'm, I'm in my best you know mood when I'm training clients. And, um, I think that the same is, uh, is true for my clients. You know, last night I trained, uh, one of my clients who works in a hospital and, uh, so things are obviously, very crazy for him right now with the whole, um, COVID situation. And, um, when I initially reached out to him to see if he was, you know, he wanted to, to do the online training, he was very excited and I, I hadn't known exactly what to expect, but it was actually a big relief for him to get back to training after taking about a month of a break. So yeah, I would just encourage, um, anybody who's, who is a trainer, who's having a tough time right now, um, because they're used to training, in person, um, people, people will be pleasantly surprised when they transition to the online, um, virtual training. So that's my two cents. Appreciate that. Um, you know, it's interesting, right? Because, um, been hearing some content around how uh, strength training right now is important virtually just because of the stress relief, but then you get the counterpoint to that, which is, oh, maybe we should be training too, too intensely because actually it can suppress the immune system, make you more um, active to the, to the virus. And, and I'm not sure, I have my own opinions. And I don't think if you're healthy, you have too much to worry about there. But um, Liam, being the, um, the veteran of the group, um, I'd love to hear you, your view on it. Like, do you have a view on, on um, whether you feel like, what's your thoughts about that? Do you think that there is a, a risk inherent if you're training too hard? Um, with the virus around, or do you think actually no, we should really be continuing this uh, this this habit uh, in order to actually relieve stress and and build up our health? Yeah, f- I, I, thank you for asking. I would say that um, for me, I I, am, I, w- I wouldn't be worried about it about training too hard. My experience is that most people don't really have the capacity or the understanding to push themselves to a place where it's genuinely going to be too hard. And then taking into account what Jesse said about different tools, um, you know, being outside of the gym and even though they're being coached. Um, so hopefully, and, and, and most of them, as Jesse knows, and we all know, um, you've, 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 you've experienced it recently yourself, Lawrence, that, um, we all do better when we are being coached. Uh, we work harder, we get more out of the moment and so forth. But that being said, I just am not worried about it. I mean, unless I know for a fact that I'm working with, a, with an individual who we, we has general, genuinely some compromised issues around their health. Um, and, and, and really, I don't work with those people. I'm working with apparently healthy individuals. And um, I think, yeah, I think it's only going to be good for them. We, we want, the, we want to, to have that or Mises, if you will, you know, that brief stressor that's going to improve everything in the long run. And um, I'm not worried about anybody doing too much. Uh, I think most of them can benefit from it. 
Eric, do you want to share your thoughts on that? What's your perspective? Well, Lawrence, I think you kind of hit it on the head when you said that for most people, um, you know, if you're a relatively healthy person, you're not going to run into any issues. But the first thing that came to my mind were the people who are maybe doing uh, like the cardio. I think most people, if they have something in their house to work with, it might be a treadmill or an elliptical machine or a bike or something like that. And so maybe if you already have like a pre-existing condition and then you're over extending yourself on a machine like that to, to the point of exhaustion, maybe if it's every single day, if it's like chronic use, I, I'm not, I'm not sure if that would impact it or not. To tell you the truth, I haven't really dug into, um, the re, you know, any kind of research, but that, that there's much out there, but I have heard people talking about it and I, for the people that, that, uh, we're dealing with, I think for the most part, they're not going to be going to the point where they're not going to be able to recover and they're not eating, you know, they're not eating enough. They're not staying hydrated, things like that. We're not dealing with that, those kind of aspects. So I think for the most part, you know, people will, they can recover. Okay. If they're, if they're training on a regular basis. Do you think though, let's take an edge case, let's take us, you know, assuming that most of us here do train hard and train to failure, even in a virtual context. Um, because we already have, I guess, uh, you know, probably a pretty high physiological headroom, as Doug McGuff would put it, like maybe we're, that's no issue. But do you think, like, let's just take the example if someone is being trained virtually and they do, they do really give it some, they go to failure and they are somewhat, you know, compromised health wise, that is a risk and they should be maybe dialing it back or is that not really that important, do you think? And I'll put that to you, Eric, but I'm, I'm really open to anyone giving their perspective on that. Well, I think when it, when it comes to the training specifically, like I, I think it's interesting that we're talking about just the training specifically, where in the roundabout things, we would also be talking about how our nutrition, our sleep, and our stress level would all impact the training part of it. So, you know, like, like I said, I think if, they're, if the person is giving it their all and they truly can't, then... Um, they truly can't do another rep or, you know, they're, they're not waiting the 24, 48 hours, maybe 72 hours between workouts and they get back to your workout and, and they're still feeling very sore, very fatigued just from the workout itself. Not to mention the other stress, you know, kids at home and they're not sleeping great because they're worried about something. Maybe they lost their job. Like all of those things need to yeah. take into consideration. So maybe even dialing back and just saying, Hey, let's, let's just do one day a week. If that person is that stressed, you got some people who are still have their income. They don't mind having their kids home. They have a spouse helping out. They're still getting, you know, eight to 10 hours of sleep a night. They're drinking plenty. They have plenty of food. Those kind of people are going to be the go getters and they're still out there. So I guess in the grand scheme of things, if I really had to say something, yeah, we need to be mindful of, of people's um, everything that's going on, including their training. So Maybe, maybe dialing it back to that one day a week might be just enough for some people. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think mindful is, is the perfect word for that uh, approach, Eric. Um, I mean, I think all of us are asking some version of, you know, the questions, you know, how did you, how did you eat? How did you sleep? You know, how's your, how's your energy today when we, when we work with a client? Right. So, I mean, I think we can, apply the same fundamentals that we do on a, on a regular basis, which are, you know, are you, do you feel up to, you know, working as hard as you can or as close to as hard as you can? And, you know, if, if people are, are really not up to that, then, you know, it might be time to take a, you know, to take a day off. And uh, I think it's going to be very subjective, you know, for someone. And that's another thing, you know, on a regular basis, when somebody comes in, people ask about that all the time. You know, should I work out while I'm sick? That's a classic. Right. That's a classic workout question. But yeah. we have we haven't addressed it directly on our podcast yet. But we talk about it all the time. Um, you know, and and again, that's it's kind of a judgment call. Uh, if you come in and you're you know you're like you barely got out of bed, then yeah, it's probably not a great idea to do a workout that day. But you know, if you've if you've been sick for a week and you know you've you've given it another week to fully recover and you just got a little bit of the sniffles you know hanging on then maybe you're good to go it's but you've got to people need to make that you know judgment for themselves and and i mean the the difference is that we have a we have a um you know a, a pandemic scale 
uh, you know, virus that's, that's going around right now. So if people think that they are experiencing symptoms of COVID, then I would say that definitely falls in the bucket of let's not do this today. Let's, let's make sure that you're, you know, we know it's a, we know it's a disease that's, uh, compromising people's, uh, aerobic, you know, uh, capacity and let's not, you know, push that to a, you know, a dangerous level. Let's try to be, try to use good judgment around it. Yeah. And I, I would, I would just like to add that. Um, yeah, I think it goes without saying that this particular group of coaches, um, I would imagine are always checking in, right? So, um, I can't imagine Eric or Jesse, um, and I know from, for myself, you know, that we're not checking in every time that we're working with these people, um, to make sure like, is this, does it make sense? I mean, I, I have clients, you know, who come in and, and to the real, to the regular gym, you know, and, and I just tell them, you know, you're not going to train today because it's clear that they're super compromised and they just think, oh, I got to work out. Right. Like it doesn't matter. Um, even though I feel like crap and, you know, uh, you know, and I go, you know what, just go home. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, I have an anecdote on that, on that note. Um, if, if we have a minute here. So yeah. when, when I was first starting out as a trainer, this was literally my first, uh, you know, couple months as a trainer. Um, I, had, I had a client come in who, unbeknownst to me, had barely slept the night before. Had We were training at night. This was like 7 or maybe 8 p.m. when we started our training session. Again, I'm just starting out and trying to take clients whenever I can. And um, so she hadn't slept hardly at all the night before, hadn't, hadn't had any water that day, and hadn't eaten a meal since noon. And it's eight hours later. And she actually fainted during the training session. And <laughs> she, to, <laughs> she, she actually, so she, she passed out just for momentarily. She came to, and we had been, we'd been, whatever exercise we were doing, she said, are we going to do another set? And I said, no, <laughs> the workout's <laughs> over. We, we are done for the day. <laughs> And, and I just, I just wasn't experienced enough at that point to, to have asked the right questions of, you know, how are you feeling? You know, how are you, how, how did you sleep? How did you eat? You know, how did you, uh, are you hydrated? And, um, so those questions, I mean, they're, they're basic, but they're also, they're fundamental. They're really, they're really crucial to be in touch with, with, you know, with our clients. Um, because, you know, my client thought that she was, you know, doing the best thing for her herself at that point, but really the best thing for herself would be, you know, to just go home and go to bed. And that really should be our top priority is, is, um, helping our clients be the best that they can be right now. Yeah. Liam, did you say you, are you doing virtual training as well? Uh, I haven't been doing much of it at the moment. I, you know, I've, over the years, I've, I've done a lot of, um, sort of cult consulting and coaching and program like design implementation, implementation and updates and so forth. But the actual sort of over the computer virtual training stuff, I'm just starting to get ready with that. I have a, just a few people that have been sort of sniffing around at it, but um, Jesse has quickly ramped it up uh, to his credit. And uh, I have been a little bit slow to, uh, to really jump on to the full blown stuff. And it's kind of ironic since I, you know, me and Eric actually talked about this not long ago and I was encouraging him to, to jump in there. And uh, I'm, I'm probably going to be the last one to get going. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, well, the reason I ask is because my next question was going to be regarding. So, so I've got a, a few questions here that were asked during the live Q&A, which I never got to. Um, and so I'm keen to get some of these answered if I can. So um jesse or eric uh, i guess i put this jesse first um in terms of the tools what are you using in terms of tools and tech to deliver virtual training um i am using whatever people have available so that's another fun step when you transition to virtual training um people might not have anything available that you might need to do pure body weight you know exercises and so that's kind of step one if someone doesn't have anything available uh we'll we'll go pure body weight people at least have a towel so i've i've been doing some time static contractions 
Um, you know, especially when it comes to the pulling movements, it's, it can be challenging to find those in, if somebody doesn't have a chin up bar or something like that. But, uh, I've, I've also, also used, um, like a bed sheet, you know, tying a knot in a bed sheet and throwing that over the door, you know, to, to do a row. Um, you know, some people, we, we actually, TNT has um, some affiliates, uh, equ equipment manufacturers. So we have been steering people towards some um, tools like uh, JC bands. Those are Juan Carlos Santana's um, adjustable resistance bands that anchor really well to doors. I've gotten, uh, I think, three of my clients to get those so far, and they are super versatile. So those are really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, some people ha do have some. Uh, dumbbells around the guys I was training last night have, you know, some adjustable dumbbells. Those were really helpful. Um, and you know, every, everyone kind of has their own, their own situation going on. So it, it, it is, again, one of those things that's very subjective, but, uh, the, the short answer is anything and everything. Could you elaborate on some of the design? So some of the training design, I know you mentioned there, sometimes it's pure body weight TSC, but could you just give some examples of some of the, uh, some of the programs you've been, you've been using with people. Sure. Um, and you know what, this, this makes me think of, of the round table and, and something that, that, uh, Luke Carlson said, which was that, um, you know, we need to try to get people away from the idea that it's the tool that, that, uh, provides the value in the exercise and remind them and ourselves sometimes that really it's, uh, and this is what we like to say on, you know, the TNT podcast is that we are, we are modality agnostic, right? So it doesn't matter, you know, what you're using, you know, if it's body weight or, or resistance bands or, you know, MedEx machines or sandbags, it doesn't, it literally doesn't matter what tool you're using as long as you use it correctly. So, um, Sacrilege. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I, I agree, you know, I, I would, I would, prefer to use, you know, some pendulum or some medex or hammer strength or, you know, it's one of my, one of my favorite brands, but it's, it's not always available. And, and not only that, but when you work with, when you work with clients, the way we do, everyone has their own personal preference and, and people in general, I think work harder when they're using their favorite tool. So that's why we tend to get stuck in that red in the first place. But I think that, that Liam and I both have a similar approach of trying to get people familiar with using as many tools, different tools as possible, um, you know, permitting, uh, you know, injuries and, and specific situations permitting. Um, so our clients are somewhat used to sometimes doing body weight exercises and sometimes using dumbbells and, you know, that sort of thing. So, so my programming uh, is dependent, you know, I, I still try to be, um, you know, have a, a diversity of types of exercises. So probably like, like, let's say a client has, has resistance bands available, dumbbells available, you know, and we always have body weight exercises available. They'll probably end up using all of them in the same full body workout. So we might do, you know, a time static contraction, you know, in a, in a row with a towel, uh, maybe a Bulgarian squat, you know, for a, for a leg movement. And maybe they'll do push-ups with a with a resistance band, you know. So, um, really, just trying to to use all of the tools that we have available and keep things interesting and and fun. That's it, right? Because if you can install some novelty uh, by using, so if they have, because I guess it can be tempting if you're inexperienced, right, to say someone's got loads of tools, but you've got your set program, and you're like, no, we're just going to do my set program and not use all those wonderful tools that you have at home. Um, that could be bad because you almost want to use as much as you can of what they have, so that you can create some novelty there, which is ultimately going to help with retaining that person, keeping that person interested in the workout, and giving it their all. Totally. Uh, I think, um, you know, strength coaches can limit themselves uh, just as much as, as clients limit themselves if we get stuck in, you know, thinking that, um, you know, one tool, uh, you know, delivers, delivers greater results, you know, than the rest. We know it's true to some extent, um, you know, with uh, superior strength curves for, you know, certain, certain instruments over, over others. But at the end of the day, um, yeah, people, 
people need to enjoy the, the workouts that they're doing and, and that's what keeps them coming back. Eric, I'd love to hear you sort of comment on workout design. Maybe we can talk about that for a fair bit because I'm actually keen to hear from uh, Liam on that and uh, from probably more from Jesse as well. But um, do you want to just, you know, I know you've been dipping your toe obviously in the online training side of things. So what have you found to be uh, effective in terms of sort of workout design with your clients? Sure. So first of all, I have to credit both uh, Liam and Jesse for me getting into this because as uh, Liam kind of mentioned, we were on a conversation. I was in a really low spot with this whole idea at first because I wasn't sure what to do. I saw all these posts online about trainers already up and running, and I thought they had all of their clients on board. And you know, obviously that's not that's not the case. But uh, I was talking to Liam on the phone, and Jesse and I were texting each other. <laughs> so they both kind of like talked me off the ledge. I was, I was in kind of a, I was in a darker place than I, I'm not kidding. I was in kind of a darker place than I usually go. Like I just wasn't sure what to do. Didn't, you know, am I failing my clients? Am I, am I failing my family by not trying to, you know, increase this income potential? But anyway, I basically just reached out to a handful of people and I got good feedback and I've been using uh, Zoom and FaceTime. And I also use a, tr- a tool called True Coach to deliver, um, workout programs that aren't necessarily virtual. They were, they're more just, these are pre-recorded exercises and they work better if you have equipment, but I do have quite a few body weight movements on there also. So I have a handful of people on there and then I'm coaching two people or what, excuse me, one person on uh, virtual training right now. But I just pulled up my workout that I'm going to have him do uh, tomorrow and he has zero equipment. I think what he has is a yoga mat. So I told him the first day, I'm like, you know, if you could just give me a quick zoom around your room and show me what we're, so show me what we're working with. Do we have, do we have, um, you know, how high are your tables in the room? Are they stable? Can we do things like step ups? We really do incline, decline, push ups, you know, things like that. So, you know, it's, it's interesting because I'm, I'm not. When I'm working with, in particular, this person, uh, he's got a live in, in a knee issue that we work around sometimes. But uh, timing squats, I don't do a lot of time under tension in terms of like counting the reps when I'm with a person very often. But now I'm finding that very, very uh, usable and pretty efficient when it comes to the, their workout. So things like counting squats or uh, doing or counting the time under tension for squats. Um, Going right into a decline push up, static towel rolls. I always make sure he has, you know, Jesse, you mentioned uh, using a bed sheet, which is a great idea, especially for rows. I've never thought about that. But I, I have him bring a, a large bath towel and we do static row, rows for time, uh, shoulder presses where you get the tension going out of the, you know, the shoulder pressing up and then lap pull downs. You got pressure coming on the way down. Um, I, I, the easy way out, I think, for a lot of people might think to do not maybe not in the circles that that we're talking with you know the the trainers and coaches but i see a lot of these programs online especially going for you know 30 minute ab workouts and (laughs) and those i I mean it's just a waste of time i think for the most part you have you can you can still do static contractions for the entire body and still get a very good workout with just a static contraction like a bicep curl or something like that so um, I mean, I'm, I'm doing, I'm having people do step ups on um, a solid chair pushed up against the wall, uh, dips on their dips and push ups on their couches. You know, we're just trying to use what we have. I have people I have people doing uh, like shoulder complexes, holding like lateral raise, front raise, and rear delt flies and shoulder presses, holding as many books as they possibly can in each of their hands and squeezing as tight as they can. So, you know, it's it's trying to get the most out of them. Uh, with the tools that they bring to the table, even if it's, if it's nothing. So it's just that that those first two appointments, I think are, is what's going to get over the hump from, for most people getting into it. And after that, it's, it's becoming easier. Yeah. I I second that. Awesome. Um, Go ahead, Jesse. Do you have anything to add to that? Or? Just saying, just saying. I second that last thought that Eric had about uh, the the first, you know, first session or two. Um, I think people, the clients who are used to training in person, will really have that realization that oh, okay, this is this is 
every bit as effective as, you know, what we were doing before. Um, they just have, people are so tactile, right? They have to, they have to have that experience. They can't be told in the abstract, this is, you know, it's, it's totally going to be great. They have to feel it and know in the moment that it, it is every bit as effective as training in person. You nailed it. That is such a good point. They have to experience it to understand it. Absolutely. Um, could you, I mean, Eric was saying there about um, tools he's using FaceTime Zoom. You said, you started saying that you use whatever, or actually I think you were referring to equipment, weren't you, in terms of you use whatever they have. But what, what tech are you actually using to deliver this? Uh, I'm on my laptop and um, I am pretty much exclusively using Zoom, although um, I'm flexible enough that if somebody needed to use another platform for some reason, like I think we're going to use, uh, I forget what Microsoft's uh, platform is, but I'm going to use that with a client next week. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the things that, that we should try to be pretty flexible about. Um, my clients are using a variety of different devices. I don't know if anybody's using a phone. I think most people are using either their laptops or, or a tablet. So um, it varies. But uh, I've, I've found Zoom to work pretty well. I'm not, I know that they have some, um, there are some concerns around their privacy, but um, I'm not super concerned with that at this point. Yeah, something to worry about later, perhaps. Um, Liam, I'm just curious, you know, you're, you're, you, as you said there, you've become a bit of a, prop- of a proponent for, for virtual training. You were suggesting to Eric to do it, talking him off the edge. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, do you think that this is something that you and Jesse will do long term after this? Obviously not as to supplant in-person personal training because that's really magical and that's great, you know, experience to have. But um, do you think you'll be doing this long term? What do you think? Uh, I hope. I honestly hope that we will be doing it. Um, I, I, again, uh, like in in one sense, I've been doing like you know, long distance programming for years. I've been, cause I've worked with literally with athletes all over the world via email, just creating programs. Um, and, uh, and this is stuff I worked on, you know, again, 11, 10, 11 years ago with my old company. And, and you know, I, I created a, an actual exercise program building machine. We were like way ahead of our time. We, we recorded 500 exercises into the database uh, my partner and I, and we could build uh, programming with all different tools and so forth. But um, I've also just been doing like sort of regular programming where I work with athletes, they contact me, I build a program for them based on what they tell me they have available and what their goals are and so forth. But as far as the virtual stuff, I'm hoping that we will continue it and we'll ramp it up and we'll, we'll it'll become like a, like a, a solid part of what we do. Um, I think that we're, we'll be good at it. I, I think that we are, I, ironically, we initially were thinking of it as a, as a sort of secondary stream down the line that we may or may not put some attention into. And obviously, we've so, like so many others, we, we're shifting our focus into this realm. But I think it's, I think it's actually a good thing in certain ways for us to get good at it and to and to understand it and to feel comfortable with it. Um, as far as the tools go, for me, I, I've been a proponent of as Jesse said, like variety, like I, I've always tried to coach all my athletes to embrace as many ways to train their muscles as possible. But um, with the in-home stuff, I've been a proponent of, of resistance bands for many, many years. And uh, I just think that the, it's probably the best tool across the board, uh, whether they're the sport loop style bands or the anchor handle style bands. They just, you can literally recreate an entire gym with resistance bands easily with a little bit of experience and imagination. And uh, they just have so many applications. It's an awesome tool. So I think uh, people, it's the, it's the tool that I drive people to the most. A lot, of what, a lot of what I've been doing currently is having people sort of in a panic reaching out to me like, how do I, how do I work out at home? What do I do? And I'm driving them towards these sort of helping them build little home gyms for themselves and saying, you know, start off by getting some bands and uh, let's figure out, how, you know, so you know how to use them. But anyway, uh, I could go on and on, but yeah, I think, I think that's, that, that, that's the best tool available for most people, you know, unless you already have a home gym, if, you've, if you own dumbbells, awesome. Um, if you have a budget and you want, you know, to get some nesting dumbbells some power blocks or some, some select tech or whatever, that's awesome. 
otherwise, bands, I think, are the best way to go. So I, let's uh, say, yeah, go on. Sorry, Eric, chime in. I just want to jump in real quick, and then I got to hop off here. But I was talking to a mutual friend, I think, of all of ours, Bill Fache, yesterday, and he was telling me how he is now, I don't think he used to use uh, resistance bands a lot, but now he is obviously at home. And he, he made an interesting point. We we're talking early morning while I was doing my workout yesterday. And he was talking about how he's really trained himself to, to feel his muscles work while, you know, during the, the exercise. And that's hopefully what we try to do to ourselves and our clients as well. It's like to feel your muscle doing the work. And he, he said something that really stuck out to me. He said, you know, our, our muscles are smarter than we give them credit for. And I think, I think that if we really pull this out of our clients and, and tell them, you know, they're going to be looking at us through the screen or, uh, you know, they're listening to our voice and stuff, but if we can help them realize how, how to move with whatever they have so they can get the most out of their own workout, you know, like it's, it, it's not about, obviously we all know this, it's not about the coach. It's not about what we can do uh, or how we do it. But if we teach our, our clients, like, slow down. Let's really get the most out of this. Here's where you should be feeling it. Here's why, here's how. Uh, I don't think that's, that's so super important now to build that into our clients. So, you know, whenever, whenever this does get back to normal, uh, I think that's even going to ramp up their, their training a little bit more, but I just thought that was really interesting how he put it. And so that's, uh, that's where I'm going to step out of this conversation on. <laughs> We'll miss I really you appreciate it, Eric. That's a good point. Good talking with you, Eric. Thanks, yeah, guys. Okay, I appreciate man. it. Talk to you later. Yeah, thanks for coming. Cheers. <laughs> uh, Liam, so here we go. I have one dumbbell. Uh, this is just a hypothetical situation. Nice. One, put him one on dumbbell. the spot. Not two. What was that? I said put him on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I have I have resistance bands, I have a towel, and then I just have a room with four walls and a floor. <laughs> well, how do you what, what? How would you construct a full body workout with just that? Number one, and not, you know, and I'm not contraindicated, and I'm healthy, and I can do stuff. Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, assuming assuming that you have have a way to anchor the bands, right? Which is most most current bands either come with some sort of anchor system um, or, or we can quickly, you know, create an anchor, a way to anchor them. But that's the most important because allow having the ability to anchor the bands at various points uh, is part of what allows you to recreate all these different movement patterns. Because if I can anchor the band at the top of a doorway I, or the middle of a doorway or the bottom of a doorway, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and then I can also add other things quickly to the band. Uh, uh, for instance, so I would I, I would use the bands depending on how much the dumbbell weighs. If it's a if it, you know, we assume if you have one single dumbbell, if is it adjustable? Is it not? Um, I would probably focus mostly on the bands uh, just because they're they're again the most diverse tool. I can use them, and I, I would build a full body workout. Uh, if we're going to start with a warm up, I might uh, just have you do you know little basic stuff, some slow body weight lunges, some push-ups, some, uh, you know, lunges with rotation, T push-ups, that kind of thing. Just a few little reps here and there to get things kind of generally moving. And then I would work on anchoring the bands. I like to start most of the time with pulling movements. So I might build, and again, it depends too. Do I have enough set of bands where I could anchor multiple points ahead of time? If not, will I have to move them around? These are all little things we'll have to deal with. But, um, I'd start them at the top of the door anchored and, and I would do some sort of pulling down movement, right? A, a row uh, or, a, or, a, or a lat pull down. And then you can turn around and, and position yourself so you can now do a chest press uh, movement with that same anchor point. Then um, I would anchor them low to the door. And now I would do holding those bands and stepping back, I, I would do a lunge. Uh, and this is a this is a movement I like to use a lot with soccer players or any type of open field athletes. Anyway, is is a is a lunge that has resistance, pulling forward and down. So now, as I'm holding those bands and they're anchored at the bottom of the door, and I'm facing directly towards the door, I step back and create that tension. 
when I take a slow step forward, I have to, I, I increase that eccentric load as I, as I land and then slowly lower the band is increasing my body weight by pulling me forward and down. And I have to overcome that, that momentum. And I have to decelerate my mass coupled with the band. And that's a great movement for athletes. And then once I've descended down, I have to generate force to be able to step back to the starting position and overcome that resistance plus the body weight and the band pulling. So that movement has, is, is a great one. And again, the reason why I like it for athletes specifically is because it does a lot of activation in the VMO uh, right over your kneecap there, that, which, you know, which is heavily involved in decelerating. So like, again, football players, lacrosse players, uh, anybody who has to change direction, slow down, accelerate, uh, it's a great movement for any kind of athlete. Um, and the reality is I, I, I base my ideas that all human beings are athletes in one sense or another, right? We, whether they play a sport or not, our bodies thrive on movement. And, and um, so that's a good movement. I can, you can also get a belt and put it around your waist. And now you can do lateral lunges against resistance with the belt attaching to the, to the, the band, if that makes sense. Um, again, so I, w- I would load different lunge patterns. Um, also using wall sits a lot. Jesse and I both are big fans of wall sits. When you use them in combination with other movements, you shouldn't underestimate the power of a really good wall sit. Uh, that again, oh, yeah. that static position. Um, and so usually what I would do is create little, little, little tri sets, if you will, of pushing, pulling and, and lower body movements and just change those angles. So I might've done two or three groups of three. So the total workout is maybe, you know, nine to 12 sets. So, and I would just change the angles of the pushes and the pulls and the, and the, and, and, and the level change stuff so that I've basically hit a little bit of a variety and couple that up with the bands and the body weight combined. Hopefully that makes sense. I, I don't want to like wax on too long about it. It's like poetry. <laughs> that, does that, that was, make sense, Lawrence? It does. <laughs> it, absolutely, no, it absolutely does. Um, I, I mean, just interested in in terms of um, uh, you, do you, what, one thing I really like about the way Discover Strength Program it is they have some exercises they'll just have a rep count because it's like a pre-exhaust um, uh-huh. and then they'll, they'll, then they'll finish you off with like, you know, wall sits for time to fail you can truly get there. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just curious, would you program in a similar way in terms of, you know, not expecting a single set to failure in every one of those? Yeah, again, in that home environment and, and depending on the person, hopefully we know, you know, we have a little bit of, like Jesse said, we're mostly working with pre-existing clients. So we generally have a rapport yeah. and under, an understanding about what their capabilities are. But um, still, that being said, depending on the tools and so forth, Definitely things are not going to be the same. Um, I don't get too hung up on it. Like sometimes I'll create a, a rep count and my, my sort of secret sauce, if you will, is, is, uh, is to consciously choose a rep count, which I know that they cannot achieve. Um, so for instance, if I know that you, Lawrence, cannot do 30 chin-ups in a row, I might tell you that you, you have to do 30 chin-ups. Um, and then you're going to think, well, there's no way I can do it. And then my goal for you is going to be do these chin-ups with perfect technique. And you're going to do as many sets of it until you hit 30. And, and then over time, ideally, it's going to take you fewer sets. Does that make sense? So maybe the first time you do it, it takes you five sets to get 30 reps. Maybe you get 12 and then you get six and then you get three you know what I mean? And then you, and then you can only do a single rep until you get to 30, but I'll make you stick with that movement. So that's just one thing I might do. So it's way outside the sort of one set to failure concept, but I might inject certain things like that into the mix. Um, again, I, I use a combination all the time of reps and time and uh, mix, mix and match for the moment, for the goals, for the program, for the person uh, for whatever I'm trying to achieve, as long as I feel like I'm getting effort. That's another one of our sort of TNT things is, you know, like think effort, right? You gotta, it's about the effort that you're putting in, um, in the moment. Can I, and I want, can I jump in and say, and just say something about Liam quickly yeah, here? This is, this is going to sound kind of funny, but I'll bring it home. I promise. 
there was this movie a couple of years back called Get Low with Robert Duvall. And this woman uh, in the movie made a comment about him. She said, that man's like a cave, right? It, it just, and it just keeps going deeper and deeper, you know, the more that you, the more that you get to know him. And Liam, I think of Liam in that, that same way. You know, I've known him for three years and um, I know that I, you know, even, even hosting a podcast together and spending all the time together, uh, you know, that we have, I know that there's so much more to learn from him because um, he, he just, his knowledge is, is so vast. And um, he really thinks of himself and we, you know, we have this in his bio on our website, you know, he pulls from, and, and now myself by extension, we, we pull from, you know, as many different, um, you know, philosophies and modalities as, as we possibly can. And, and Liam, I think, aptly put that, uh, you know, uh, it's almost like Jeet Kune Do, like Bruce Lee's, you know, style of, you know, pulling from different martial arts. Um, so kind of what, what Liam's describing with the, you know, the 30 chin-ups example, um, obviously, you know, a lot of high-intensity trainers are not, you know, going to go with a high-volume approach, but we do sometimes. Um, most of the time when we're training our clients, it's a, it's a lower volume, you know, single set to failure. Um, but again, you know, in terms of making things, making the workout interesting and fun and challenging for people, sometimes a high volume approach is, is really effective and, and some people might even prefer it. And so it's nice to have the best of both worlds where, you know, somebody can train, you know, in the high intensity style um, where we're, you know, adhering to the size principle and making sure we, we work as hard as we can, but also doing a little bit more volume sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with that. Liam, I'm just curious, how many times have you butted heads with um, high intensity training evangelists? <laughs> you know, um, I, I don't usually have, have any issues with those guys. I, I, interestingly enough, I, I get, you know, the usual stuff over the years um, of, you know, how, how high intensity training doesn't work and, you know, one set to failure doesn't work and, and, you know, um, athletes don't use it. You know, there's all this weird stuff that you hear all the time, which is a hundred percent not true. Um, I've been lucky enough and, you know, my career has been going for such a long time now that, and I, I, I've been lucky enough to meet and work with and collaborate with just so many amazing coaches. Uh, and I just have this incredible network at my fingertips of guys I can literally just call up and, uh, chat with and ask questions and, and bounce ideas off of, and, um, and they have some broad approaches of their own. Um, one of the kind of general things that I say, maybe it's a Liamism is, um, you know, that if you, if you get all these coaches together, r regardless of their overriding philosophy, you know, and we sit down in a room, there's going to be like 10 things that we're all going to agree on a hundred percent. And those are the only 10 things that really, really matter. Uh, and outside of those things, it starts to become personal preference and marketing and trying to create a niche for yourself, you know, and um, I, I don't worry about that. I, you know, I, I've, I, I, I know what I'm doing is uh, safe and efficient and effective. And that's my underlying thing is, you know, how can I deliver this? And like, as we say on every episode of TNT, our goal is to help people get as strong as possible as safely, as efficiently as possible. Um, and, and that's, that's the, that's what we need to do. Um, but you have to be flexible as Jesse was saying, as I was just mentioning in your approach, you, you don't want to get so stuck in it. Like you hear it from many of these guys, Lawrence, I don't mean to ramble on, but many of these guys who I'm sure you've encountered yourself over the years with your podcast, will will many of them started out as these hardcore Arthur Jones gospel guys. And that's the only way. And if you're not doing it that way, you're doing it wrong. And over, over the courses of their own careers, they've recognized and, and, and understood to embrace a little more flexibility is a good thing. Um, some of them. You, <laughs> even, yeah, some of them. Even Arthur Jones, even Arthur Jones you know, recognized that he had made some mistakes and, you know, over the years, you know, and, and even he near the end of his, of his career and his life recognized, you know, hey, maybe uh, you don't need to train three times a week to failure and all those kind of things and, you know, training less. And, and even talking to Jim Flanagan as an example, uh, last time I saw Jim Flanagan, uh, you know, he was talking about how he might work out really hard only once every few weeks, you know? 
Uh, and he's, he's not doing the three time a week to failure, you know, kind of thing. So yeah, there's many ways to do it, but as long as it's safe, it's efficient, you know, that it's working and you, and you can track all that, you know, the, the numbers don't lie. Yeah. You know, you just reminded me there, cause I'm assuming you read the last thing before you saw Jim was, was at rec, was it pre rec 2019? No, well, uh, Jesse and I were, were down there with Luke and, uh, Jim at the, uh, at the real hit experience. Ah, oh, of course. Yeah. How did you find that? I, I, I personally thought it was fantastic. I mean, it was pretty much exactly what I expected it to be, but I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Yeah. I, I, uh, you, sorry, second, go on, yeah, I, I second that. Um, I thought it was an incredible experience. Um, I know you are well aware of this, Lawrence, you've had him on your podcast several times, but I, I think Luke Carlson really has his uh, finger on the pulse of uh, really the future of this industry. And um, so that was, that was, to me, it was an invaluable experience to be able to sit down next to him and, uh, and talk business. And uh, it was a whole lot of fun too. You know, we got to get trained in Jim Flanagan's home gym. I, I think, uh, you know, I have pictures and videos of that and it's definitely a memory that I'll, I'll take with me. Um, and to me, it felt like, I think probably a lot of people felt like meeting Arthur Jones. Um, you know, and I know that I'm kind of on this cusp of maybe a new generation of high intensity trainers. And, um, so that was, it was really cool for me to be able to create that memory with, with all those guys. Does this mean that you're both now traction converts? Cause I know I believe that Luke uses kind of the traction principles when he's sort of teaching how to run the business, uh, during uh, real hit. We were, yeah, we were definitely talking about some of that stuff. Um, and as always, there was a, a lot of conversation around um, Jim Collins' work and Good to Great and Built to Last. And that was one of the things that that really kind of drew me to um, him and his, uh, you know, I got, we got to both, I don't know if Liam was in that presentation, but I got to, I got to see Luke's presentation at URSA in uh, 2019. So uh, I, I read Built to Last a couple of years ago, and you know I agree with a lot of the people who say that it's you know the business bible, and uh, and uh, yeah, so I don't really know where I was going with that, but um, that's fine. That's, you know what? I'm embarrassed to admit I've never read Jim Collins any of his books, uh, and I hope Luke doesn't listen to this because Luke will be uh, <laughs> upset. He hates well, me. Luke, you you know if if you've heard Luke speak, you don't need to read the book because that guy. I mean, he must have every word memorized. I mean, um, it's it's incredible. But if you seriously though, if you, if you do get the chance to read those books, they're incredible. 100%. If you're high, you know, bring your highlighter because you're you're gonna bring. Multiple, oh yeah, I mean, you're gonna run out of ink. I remember this morning I was um I was doing some testing on some marketing and. I re-listened to a podcast I did with Luke inside Hit Business Membership. And um, basically, it's all about doing a rifle shot when you test anything in your business. And that's a, that's a good to great concept uh, from Jim Connors. I'm not sure if you remember that one. Um, but it's basically low investment, low distraction tests so that when you're trying something new, that you don't end up making a very expensive mistake, yeah. right? Uh, in short. And uh, it's just, yeah, it's a phenomenal concept. Um, and as I read that article, I was like, went into an Evernote list, which is like a reading list I have. And I looked at Good to Great, which sat on there for ages. And it's got like seven asterisks next to it, which means I should probably read it. <laughs> um, so, so I'm getting there. I'm getting there. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's weird that I haven't read any of his work yet. I have listened to his um, podcast on, on the Tim Ferriss show, which is very good. Um, yep. I listened to that same one. He, Jim Collins uh, met met his wife, and I think they were they were married like seventy two hours later or something like that. Yeah, right, right, exactly. <laughs> um, and his stories about Peter Drucker are so cool. I'm a big Peter Drucker fan. I love his his work. So yeah, that was cool. Um, I just want to actually ask you guys. You know, you were both at Rec 2019. Um, what what were your sort of highlights from the event and Put that to you, Jesse, and then obviously Liam. Let me know as well. Oh man, there were uh, there were a lot of really great. I mean, for me, because we had been running the podcast, we've been we've been putting episodes out since 2018. 
Um, and Liam has met a lot of the guests that we've had on, but I still hadn't met them in person. So that was, I think, the number one thing that was really cool for me is I got to put a face to the name or the voice, as it were. And, um, you know, I got to meet uh, like Patty Durrell in person. I I had actually already met her at at URSA, but um, got to meet Dwayne Wimmer, got to meet you, Lawrence, got to uh, got to meet Luke Carlson. Uh, Jim Flanagan, you know, you name it, got to meet all all different kinds of people and network. And that was really incredible. Um, I really enjoyed the keynotes. I still remember um, Dr. James Fisher talking about, uh, you know, the different muscle sizes. And that kind of got us all to rethink, uh, you know, our, the pre-exhaust protocol, I think, or at least it got me to rethink it. And um so yeah, it was it was it was fascinating from a people perspective and and also from a learning perspective. I I remember that, um, and I think he was uh, presentation. Didn't he talk about how the triceps muscle cross sectional area or whatever um, is larger than the pectoralis? And if it, well, I can't even remember if that was right. Um, that's that's my yeah. Is that what we're going? Yeah, that's, that's my recollection. Was, yeah, how did that then? I'm curious. How did that uh, maybe you can ask, how has that informed maybe your changes? I mean, like would that change how you would do a pre-exhaust sequence, knowing that information. I mean, I, I don't think it really changed. It doesn't make me love pre-exhaust any less. I'll put it that way. But it made me it made me reflect back to the Nautilus principles, you know, and, and Arthur Jones talking about, you know, well the the pecs are the biggest muscle on the torso, and so you know we work them first in the pre exhaust so that you know the other other muscles work harder in the in the compound following the you know the isolation movement. We're talking about maybe like a, a pec fly into a chest press now, and um, so so it doesn't make me think, oh, that's not exactly what's happening. It just makes me think, okay, well. This is yet another one of the protocols that we have available to us to ramp up the intensity of an exercise, which in my mind is if somebody's right healthy and, and able is pretty much always a good thing. So Liam, did you want to add to that? I think you would jump in there. Um I would say that, you know, for me, for the the my experience of, of the rec was um, you know, similar in some ways, like uh as far as uh getting to meet people or, or, you know, get, the, get some FaceTime. Some of these people for me, I've had professional relationships for many years. It's, you know, it's one of the weird things of the internet world, right? I, I mean, there's, I've literally known some coaches uh, for 15 or 20 years and never actually met them in person. And um, Patty and Dave Durrell were two people that I'd had a relationship with for a long time. Um, I've, I'd known Luke professionally and Dwayne Wimmer and those guys, but I had not spent a lot of time with any of them. But, um, and, you know, I got to meet Matt Hedman and I, I, I like what he's doing with the, uh, with the perfect workout. And, uh, that was an interesting thing, um, because I didn't know that he was like a giant. <laughs> um, cause I, yeah, he always looks like, a, he always looked like a nerd when you see little pictures of him, you know. <laughs> And then I was like, whoa, this guy, this guy looks like he's a professional like baseball player or something. He's a, he looks like a big athletic dude. But um, I thought, I, you know, meeting, so meeting people from all around was great. But honestly, my favorite moment was uh, I uh, organically took a break and was sitting in the hallway and um, a gentleman sat down next to me and we struck up a conversation casually. And it turned out to be the guy that... Um, is the guy behind all the Dynavec equipment, the guy that invented the gluteator and uh, all those um, multiplanar uh, moving machines. And uh, he was a fascinating guy. And uh, that just totally happened, like, you know, just by chance. Yeah, and we, we had a great connection. We had a really nice conversation. Uh, it, 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 we created a bridge. We ended up talking to Jeff Casebolt from Dynavec as a guest. But uh, getting to meet the actual guy behind the concepts and so forth, and just oh, sort of have that yeah. happen naturally was a really uh, was a real highlight for me. That's Kent, isn't it? Is that his name? Kent? Yes. I think yeah, yeah. yeah. There he, go. He, I really like that guy. Uh, he was a great guy. Yeah. We had a nice time. Awesome. Um, guys, I just had some questions about specific questions on training that I'm interested in, in asking you both. Uh, 
you know, you, you both mentioned in the podcast you did, you talked about conditioning as a separate event um, in, I think, your training and maybe in your client's training. And um, as you both know, um, obviously in high intensity training, you're obviously getting a, you know, a, 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 uh, you're getting a, a cardiovascular stimulus, um, an improvement to the cardiovascular system. And obviously, if you want to improve skills outside of strength training, you have to practice a specific skill. But I'm just curious, what's the logic from your perspective with how, why you both incorporate separate conditioning workouts or, or exercise into your overall regimen? And I'd put that to Jesse, I suppose. <laughs> okay. Um, well, the short answer is we we don't necessarily. You know, we're we're similar to, uh, you know, the majority of hit you know studios and and trainers and business owners where we are generally recommending that people do you know an intense brief strength training session twice a week. With that said, you know, we need to take each individual's, what Liam likes to say, their, their beliefs, needs, and desires. Do I have that right, Liam? Good enough. But believe, so, <laughs> so basically, you know, they're each person's individual situation into account. And um, so we try to be a little bit flexible with that. If somebody likes, you know, to do, to do conditioning separate, like I'll give you an example. I have, I have one client who uh, try as I might uh, to get her to flip the flip the script. Um, she does an hour of hard walking, uh, like like on a treadmill on a steep incline. Uh, you know, pour buckets of sweat right before our strength training every time. And we've I, we've talked countless times about it. There have been a couple times when she didn't you know, have the time to go, you know, walk on the treadmill before our strength workout. Her strength workouts were much better when that happens. But for her, she's just, she's just got to do it. It's just one of those things. It's just, you know, it, she just, she just, it feels good for her to do that. And, and we have to remember that when we're working with human beings, people have idiosyncrasies like that, right? Not everybody falls into the box of, okay, great. Twice a week, you know, Monday, Thursday, great set, set it and forget it, you know? Um, so really just try to be kind of flexible with that. And that's not to say that we don't, you know, assert to people that they are conditioning when they're, you know, doing their brief intense workout. Um, you know, I, one of my favorite things to do is to point is to ask somebody in the moment, right? Right after they, right after they finish say this is somebody I'm training, you know, early on, it's a new client or maybe a potential client and they've never experienced, you know, training to failure or close to failure or even working hard while they're lifting weights. You know, I, I really, I really try to get them to slow down and be present and take note of the things that they're feeling in their body, right? Do you feel your heart beating faster? Do you feel your lungs, right? Your lungs, you know, uh, you know, pulling in air, you know, heavier and you know quicker than than you were a couple minutes ago and when people really notice that they're more receptive to the idea that okay the muscles can't work without the heart and the lungs right so um at that point you know i'll, I'll point out to them you know it's kind of it's it's a little bit ridiculous to think that you need to now go on the run and uh, run on the treadmill for an hour after your after your workout you're you're it's like you're running on a treadmill while you're lifting the weights. I think some of that has to do with just the setting that we're in being in the big box gym. Um, you know, that kind of, that business model is different than, you know, biz, uh, you know, hit studios where they might not have the, de the, the dedicated cardio, um, section, uh, people, people in our gym are conditioned by the business model to, to think that, you know, to buy into that kind of classic, uh, you know, fitness industry misconception that, you know, you got to do the cardio and you've got to do the, the strength. So um, really in a nutshell, it just boils down to kind of what a person, you know, we've got people that, you know, they want to, they want to lift weights three times a week. And we've got other people who, who just do it once a week or, or every other week, it's people's budgets, you know, you have to take that into account too. So it's all kinds of different situations. Sure. Yeah, I, I, yeah go I want to I want to dive in on that for a second. There's two things um, that that he kind of 
one that he definitely sort of brushed across, but it, there's there's more to the fact than just the cultural thing, which definitely is undeniable in the sense that people have been programmed about cardio for a million years and and also the gyms, you know, have those all that equipment available and, you know, people just haven't learned or understood. But the other issue is that in that setting, we don't have the luxury of having all those machines available and and also unimpeded, right? So we have to be super flexible in our application. Unlike someone who has a owns a studio, there's only one client or two in there at a time. They they have the entire place at their disposal. We have a giant space filled with hundreds of people that have that are doing their own thing that have nothing to do with us. And Jesse and I might have a perfect plan on paper that day, but you know, if I plan to do these three exercises in a row with no break, and there's a guy sitting there saying, I got five more sets, man, you know. God, uh, <laughs> then then there's nothing I can do Especially about that. They're on I, Instagram in between. You know? yeah, yeah. So I have to change in the moment perhaps and rethink my entire plan. And so the reality is my plans are constantly evolving live and in person because of the constraints of that big box environment. So that's number one, why I can't apply it in the in the truest sense that I would like. Because I do acknowledge it and recognize and, and agree with you that it can solve everything by itself if it's applied perfectly. But it's in, in our environment, that's almost impossible to do. So that's number one. The other thing with me is because I work with athletes specifically over many, many years, and I address this as what I call energy system development, right? So I want to make sure, again, depending on the, the tools and the environment, that they are addressing the system specifically to the demands that are placed in their sport. For instance, I work with hockey players quite a bit. And if you know anything about ice hockey, um, you know, there's they're on the ice for a certain amount of time and they're off the ice and they're in lines and the lines are constantly changing in and out. So it's literally the perfect sport for an interval training environment where you can create specific work to rest ratios because it's built right in. And when they're on the ice, they're going 100%. They're pushing themselves to the maximum. That's why they're constantly jumping on and on and off the ice because they can't c- continue that pace and the lines have to switch out. So when I work with hockey players, I, I know, okay, you spend this much time on the ice and you're off the ice two lines out and I'm going to build specific energy system programs that are going to tax them for those real specific work to rest ratios. And you can look at a lot of sports in that context. So I will do that specifically for the athletes in mind. Um, again, this is with athletes. Um, and again, I agree with you also about the skills. Skills are highly specific. And depending on the sport, sometimes the skill and the ability to generate those skills while moving and so forth are build in some condition, conditioning components of their own. But uh, I like to look at the compartments and combine them. Uh, and that's why I might do it, uh, depending on the client that's in front of me. And the other part is I do agree with Jesse too. Like sometimes you just have people that just love it or want it or feel like they need it. And that's okay too. But um, a lot of times for me, I'm working with athletes. And so I'm designing those programs specifically to meet the demands of their sports. Got it. Yeah. I, I yeah, think each I, of us, uh, can I say one more, one more thing on that? I think, I think yeah. each of us, if someone came to us as a blank slate and just said, I will do right. There are no budgetary limitations. I'll do whatever you you know, whatever you say, I have total faith in you. Uh, we probably would have them lift, you know, probably no longer than 30 minutes, you know, try to limit, limit rest between exercises and, you know, train the full body twice a week. So. Yeah. No, I really respect your, uh, you know, your decision and how you look at this. Uh, makes sense. Gents, I uh, don't ever buy AirPods and they, they run out of power far too quickly. <laughs> and uh, mine are literally about to go second, so I'm going to have to to wrap it up and um, need to, to end it a little shorter than I would have would have liked to. Um, maybe we can do a part two at some point to get into stuff in more depth. So, what's the the best way for people to find out more about you guys? Where shall I send them? So you can, uh, if you want to contact us directly, you can email us at contact at truthnottrendspodcast dot com. You can also just visit our website. It's truthnottrends.com. You can Google us. Uh, we have a ton of blog content out there. Liam is a prolific writer, and uh, he's put some really incredible uh, writing up on our blog on our website. It goes back to 2018, so there are 
There's writing on all different types of subjects. I've also started to put some blog content up there recently. And uh, yeah, so that's how you reach us. Awesome. And then yeah, we'll try and link some of that stuff up in the, in the post for this. Absolutely. And I was going to say, we're also, of course, on all the basic platforms for, you know, Spotify, Google, uh, iTunes, right? If pe- for the podcast itself. So people can just type in whatever the, whatever the platform they like and, t- you know, type in Truth Not Trends, they can find us. Yeah. And uh, for everyone listening, if you're interested in evidence-based exercise and two people that are just really smart and love talking about training, um, then check out TNT podcast truth not trends i'll link it up in the show notes it's awesome they're doing a great job they're doing great work i appreciate it um and just want to say guys i really appreciate you taking the time and uh, again sorry to cut this a little shorter than i would have hoped but perhaps we'll uh, do this again sometime yeah yeah no we'll look forward to it thank Lawrence, you Lawrence. We're really we've been looking forward to talking to you it was great to meet you in person at the rec and we were very excited uh, for the opportunity yeah oh, i think uh of course I've been listening to your show for a couple of years now, Lawrence, and I, I just want to thank you for putting out such great content. I think it was, uh, might've been Jim Flanagan that uh, told the story about how early on, you know, he, he decided to invest, you know, whatever money it was that he had to, to go up and learn from uh, some salesman over on the East Coast. And he said that was one of the best investments he ever made. And I think I heard that first on, on uh, back when you were a corporate warrior before you rebranded. <laughs> And, uh, and that was one of those things that it literally stuck in my mind for like, like two years. And, um, that was one of the primary things that, that pushed me over the edge to go do the, um, the real hit experience. And I'm super grateful that I did. So thank you. Cause I think you were, um, the, one of the motivating forces around that. Oh, well, thank you. And I appreciate it. That's always really cool to learn. I love hearing stuff like that. Um, and for everyone listening, to find the blog post for this episode and download the PDF transcript, please go to highintensitybusiness.com and search for episode 266. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. Discover how to achieve your health and fitness goals, become a great personal trainer, and build a successful high-intensity training business. Check out highintensitybusiness.com. Highintensitybusiness.com.